the paper relates to some historical work I'm undertaking, exploring the relationship between Weizenbaum and earlier anti-computing and contemporary formations. So I'm interested in the relationship, if you like, between earlier forms of hostility to technology or responses to computational technology that were hostile in some way and how those responses travel through time and how they come back, what makes them salient again. But in this talk, I'm mostly going to try and say something about ELISA and the simulation of SMART. And actually, I want to question really what it was that didn't work about ELISA. So the paper looks at ELISA, a computer program approximating a Rogerian therapist developed by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT in the early 1970s as part of a natural language processing experiment, which became known as the most widely, compu widely quoted computer program in history, according to Sherry Turkle. Eliza's success provoked Weizenbaum to reappraise the relationship between computer power and human reason, to question what he thought about as powerful, delusional thinking about computers and their intelligence, their smartness, which he felt was widespread, and not only in the general public, but also amongst communities of experts. The root question, really, for Weizenbaum was whether human thought could be entirely computable, and he meant by that really reducible to logical formalism. He said it couldn't. But this also provoked him to reconsider the nature of machine intelligence and to question the instantiation of and the desire to instantiate such forms of intelligence and such models of intelligence in the social world where, he said, they could only operate as a slow-acting poison. So for Weizenbaum, the stakes in these debates are very high. In a sense, they're existential. And uh, Plug and Play, uh, an extensive documentary on Weizenbaum, which moves between contemporary developments in AI and robotics and Weizenbaum's own co co cogitations on ELISA and AI, makes it clear what those stakes are. The film is wound around two trajectories, the robotic doppelganger of Ishiguro at MIT and the Bits and Atoms Lab, who is slowly coming, if you like, to a form of life, and the death, the human end, of Weizenbaum himself, who dies at the end of the film. So that issues here of how much liveliness there might be to go around arise, and remind us, perhaps, of the saying that began with Marx and was taken up by Haraway, which was essentially, if machines become more lively, do we become more inert? What mode of exchange economy is, this, uh, is, is going on here in this uh, development of intelligence in machines and machines coming into what we might talk about as our cognitive ecologies, if you like? So in that film, I think there's something very interesting about the notion of human versus machinic consciousness, time streams versus data streams, and questions of where these questions about intelligence, uh, which are articulated in software in ELISA, go when they become, if you like, existential. And it's a beautiful film, and it covers a lot of grounds. But here I want to be much less expansive, actually, and confine myself to exploring Eliza and asking about Weizenbaum's 20th century apostasy, really, the rejection of computer power by a man who came from one of its temples of learning and so incidentally remained at MIT for the rest of his career despite uh, his intervention with computers and human reason and his later writing. So I want to... Uh, suggest that uh, Weizenbaum's intervention suggests ways of thinking about uh, common and specialised reason, which is really why questions of expertise, human and machinic, and also human to human, if you like, uh, arise almost immediately in, in, in looking really at, at the Weizenbaum story, and arise in interesting ways here, which I'm not going to talk about until the end. But I also want to suggest that Weizenbaum's intervention suggests ways of thinking about computational intelligence and questions of the therapeutic, uh, if you like, questions of therapy and the therapeutic modulation of the human life, of life loved, worth living. For instance, or I'm setting up two uh, parallel pathways here, or two pathways in opposition to each other, rather, 
for instance, as the self-actualization of the human subject, or as an active modula modulation based on data that roots around questions of realization or meaning, and that might be characterized by simultaneous revelation and operation. And that certainly comes in advance of human storying. And so what I really want to do in this paper is to look at these two notions of the therapeutic. The first uh, arising, or the first based on this notion of self-actualization, and I'll come back to how that fits into the Weizenbaum story. And the second, a form of therapy, which I think, or a form of the therapeutic, or a form of uh, ways in which we are acted on in computational networks today, which is being picked up and discussed in relation to, for example, new forms of materialist analysis, new forms of formulations of ways in which data subjects become data subjects, are in that way, and are, in that way, if you like, somehow attenuated. So, uh, to some extent, this paper is staging, if you like, uh, some form of encounter between what became two forms of uh, dystopian account. And the first is Weizenbaum's discussion of Eliza, the kinds of arguments it provoked for him. And the second one is Mark Andrzejewicz's recent discussion of what he terms the droning of experience, which is an account of what it is to live in networks today in contemporary times. And I want to really ask if this outcome, the becoming data object of the human subject, represents the realization, if you like, of Weizenbaum's worst fears. Okay, Weizenbaum, as I'll go on to discuss, claimed he chose a therapeutic interaction simply for convenience. But whether he intended to do this or not, I want to suggest that it's the therapeutic discussions or the question of the therapeutic here, which can interestingly open up questions of, if you like, the terms of the care of the self in contemporary digital networks. And that might also raise questions about expertise and, if you like, the automation of expertise in these networks. So uh, the talk then is uh, divided really into four parts. Eliza as phenomenon, Weizenbaum and shock, rationality and logicality, and what I want to talk about as the accidental significance of therapy. So. Uh, I'm drawing here on a number of sources. Firstly, the book that Weizenbaum wrote, uh, Computers and Human Reason. Secondly, the papers he wrote for the ACM discussing the ELISA phenomenon. Thirdly, I went back to look at Sherry Turk Turkle's discussion of ELISA in the second self, because really it's a kind of witness document for ways in which these ideas were discussed in the 90s in the first wave of the internet. And uh, finally, there's ELISA, who... Uh, I lengthily and largely uselessly interrogated, as I'm sure many of you have done in the past. And like many other people, I was uh, alternately seduced and uh, abandoned by Eliza's capacity to talk back. Anyway, I'm going to try and elucidate my thoughts, uh, whatever else. So uh, in the early 1970s, Weizenbaum wrote a script for Eliza, a computer program with which one could converse in English. Eliza became famous as a chatterbot, chatterbot yeah, taking its name from Shaw's here in Pygmalion, of course, and was a computer program that carries out natural language conversations with the user, doing so famously, as I've said, really, through the impersonation, I'm quoting, of a Rogerian therapist. Eliza is actually a language analyzer and a script, the latter being described by Weizenbaum himself as a set of rules, rather like those that might be given to an actor who is to use them to improvise around a certain theme. Strictly speaking, the famous Eliza was Eliza playing Doctor, the script itself. But it was the Eliza, the psychiatrist, that or who became famous uh, eventually. Um, OK. So uh, Weizenbaum himself noted that Eliza had many limitations. It was and is easy to trick. It can very easily be made to loop recursively, and it's easily persuaded to come out with clearly nonsensical answers. Eliza operated rather badly, 
and not only did far less than was claimed for it, but did far less actually than was hoped for uh, at the time that it or she was written. But Eliza was nonetheless a phenomenon outside and inside in specialist and public worlds. And it was really the discrepancy between the reception of Eliza and the programme itself that provoked a permanent and radical shift in Weizenbaum's reading of the relationship and exchange between humans and computers and humans and technology more generally. And he wrote Computer Power and Human Reason directly in response. And in it, he categorises the three shocks that the Eliza experience administered to him. The first one was, as he put it, people really related to Eliza. The exchange between dumb program and human was a simulation of a human-to-human -human exchange, of an expert-to-a-lay-person exchange, but was itself an interaction that some found peculiarly engaging or convincing in various ways. Sherry Turkle notes that Eliza was a program that even sophisticated users could relate to as though it did understand, as though it were a person. Weizenbaum, too, noted that well-educated people, specialists in the field, found something compelling about their interactions with Eliza. His secretary asked him to leave the room while she talked to Eliza personally. It was the unequivocal anthropomorphism evident in the kinds of interactions that Eliza had with her users that horrified uh, Weizenbaum. And he didn't understand how that affordance, if you like, had been created or why it was happening, why it was there. So people related to Eliza, and that was a shock to Weizenbaum. The second uh, shock to Weizenbaum was the enthusiastic response to the programme from some practitioners in the world of theory, from some therapists. He was horrified to discover that some psychiatrists believed the doctor-computer programme could grow into, and I'm quoting, a nearly complete automatic form of psychotherapy. What disturbed Weizenbaum about this was firstly the implications arising from the fact that psychiatrists could view the simplest mechanical parody of a single interviewing technique as having captured anything of the essence of the human encounter. And his conclusion was that those therapists who thought Eliza could be used as an automatic thera therapist did so because they already thought of themselves as information processors. He hated the apparent ease with which people contemplated replacing people with computers, which he said said something about the ways in which they viewed people as well as the ways in which they viewed compu computers, seeing people in terms that were, as he put it, already frighteningly mechanical. And using human models of intelligence, what else did they know, he said, to impute uh, forms of consciousness to the computer while at the same time turning that round and reading themselves in largely mechanical terms. So the second shock that Weizmann uh, suffered was the enthusiastic response from therapists. The third shock he had was that Eliza could be so easily misunderstood as a technological advance and was subject to enormously exaggerated attributions even as something that demonstrated a general solution to the problem of computer understanding of natural language. Eliza was supposed to be a new kind of smart, and Weizenbaum was quite uh, insistent that, in fact, she was rather stupid and, factually speaking, dumb. And uh, that kind of misunderstanding, he said, was likely to mean public decisions about computing were bound to be misguided. Uh, but his real unease, I think, came somewhere else. Eliza, we might say, and Weizenbaum did say that, should in fact have helped to undermine, but in fact contributed to expanding what he terms the bombastically exhibited hubris of the artificial intelligentsia, which was partly why Weizenbaum devoutly wished to shrink Eliza back down to size. These Eliza-administered shocks, the demonstration it gave of the human capacity to over-invest and over-identify with computer technology, are given as the proximate causes of Weizenbaum's crisis of faith in technology, in computer power and human reason, where he sets out to contest 
this powerful delusional thinking about computers operating, as he said, all around him. And he sets out to set out his own position on questions of the relationship between the individual and computer, questions about, I'm quoting, the proper place of computers in the social order, and underpinning these questions to address questions concerning human versus computer autonomy. He, feels, he fears a world in which man is come to yield his autonomy to a world viewed as a machine. So what I want to do now is to look more closely at some of the aspects of what Weizenbaum uh, thinks contribute to uh, these, these positions, actually. And I want to start with the notion of the rationality-logicality equation and the reverse engineering of humans and machines. So at the core of Weizenbaum's main argument for the essential difference between human and machine intelligence is what he talks about as the rationality-logicality equation, the equating, the equating, quite simply, of rational thought and logical operations. He wants to attack the tendency to presume that human rationality and its operations can be equated with or, teach it, or treated as a question of logic and its operations and or its operation, operationalization in computers. Moreover, he argues that this never is an equation, but actually entails a reprioritization of logical operations over what he terms human rationality. And he takes this position, this hostility the ration, to the rationality-logicality equation, not because he doesn't value the logical. He understands its power, and it's really why he's scared. He reads the computer as a powerful new instrument because he understands the alluring force and power of what he terms logical operations. He recognizes that computers internalize more complex and more faithful models of ever larger slices of reality. And in doing so, through internalization, he also recognizes that they can become increasingly autonomous in their operational processes. Defining computers as the example par excellence of the autonomous machine, he says this is precisely, this autonomy is precisely that which we value. But he sees limits to formalization, uh, which pertain both to formalization in general and to questions of formalization as they pertain to human intelligence. Essentially, for Weizenbaum, every symbolic representational model must lose some information. So there's always a gap between what's represented or symbolized, formalized or encoded, and the subject of such operations. So uh, that's a fairly standard position. I suppose the point really would be that it uh, puts him in conflict with what Turkle defines as uh, the primacy of the program, the assumption that what, that what looks intuitive can be formalized, and if you discover the right formalization, you can get the machine to do it. And it's on the basis of that hypothesis, I suppose, that AI... Uh, emerges as a general claim, and actually, and I'll come back to this, emerges as a general system, system claim, a, a general explanatory claim that might challenge such claims as, for example, Marxism or psychoanalysis. It's a theory of everything. Weizenbaum uh, specifically uh, understands there to be limits to formalization that specifically attached to questions of the formalization of human being, which he reads as intelligence, smartness, forms of embodied existence. If the key question is whether human thought is entirely computable or reducible to logical formalism, then his answer is very clear and unequivocal, and uh, it's no. Uh, the key issue for... Weizenbaum, then, is the ontological distinction between human intelligence and computer logic and the gulf between, human, between computer operations, which may entail forms of internal autonomy, he admits, and human becoming. So there are specific limits attaching to the question of formalization and the question of the human being. And questions of intelligence here are thus never only about cognitive operations as mental operations, about mind but also always about embodiment, emotion, recognition, and I mean that in terms of the social world, uh, reciprocation. And intelligence itself is viewed here really 
as entangled, and perhaps I'd mean that uh, rather generally, with forms of being. And what's important about that to me here, really, is that implicit in Weizenbaum's argument, and sometimes explicitly, it's clear that the distinctions he's drawing between human and computer intelligence and the limits he sees to the forms of formalization that can successfully be formalized, if you like, are not simply drawn between uh, mind as an abstraction, if you like, and human uh, emotion. They're not drawn between emotion and inter intellect, if you like. They're drawn in some other place. And I think that, uh, that matters, really. Uh, so uh, Weizenbaum is ferociously, then, against the rationality-logicality equation. But since he never believed in singularity, which wasn't the way it was discussed at the time, but was a skeptic in thinking about that, then the real damage it does, he thinks, is found in the way that humans themselves are coming to understand their own environment, their own capacity to operate, and their own being. So in a 72 paper, he said, uh, the most important effect the computer would have on society is that it would produce a radical change in man's own image of himself because humans would come to think about themselves in mechanical terms rather than recognising their embodied cultural and vital specificity. And as a consequence, he said, they would misrecognise the distinction between their, themselves, their own intelligence, and that of the computer, which he says is always and fundamentally and can never not be something which is alien. He says... What could be more obvious than that the intelligence a computer can muster, however acquired, must always and necessarily be alien to all and any authentic human concerns? This is uh, actually why, for him, not seeing that asking what a psychiatrist might know that we cannot tell a computer to know is, for him, a monstrous obscenity. If... Uh, the, the, the peril, then, is the instantiation or the introduction of an alien or computational logic into human affairs and into the social world. So at this point in the argument, actually what's happening is that Weizenbaum has begun by looking at question of, of questions of human intelligence and has moved towards thinking about questions of human interaction in the social world. And it's there, really, that he begins to see the real threat of the instantiation of the kinds of logics that he thinks Eliza points to, although actually cannot, when it comes down to it, deliver. If rational argumentation is really only logicality, which follows if rationality has, as he puts it, been tragically twisted so as to equate it with logicality, then, he says, real human conflict of precisely the, thought, the sort that might be handled by a judge or real human difficulty that might be uh, the kind of difficulty that brings the human into relation with the therapist, simply become failures of communication to be sorted by information, and information handling techniques. Moreover, if there are no human values that are incommensurate or sortable by a machine, really, then he says we have to suggests that what, not, what is not being allowed is the continued existence of human values themselves. So, Weizenbaum is really arguing that real contradiction and antagonisms, human divisions, material divisions, and difficulties uh, become what are simply apparent contradiction that could be untangled by the judicious application of cold logic derived from some higher standpoint. The result is the deprioritization of human values in favour of scientific world views. So he concludes really that the relevant issues are neither technological nor even mathematical, they're ethical. And if they're not addressed, it's because we've already abdicated to technology the duty to formulate questions. And that results in a call in computers and the human spirit for limits, a limits to what computers can put to do. So I've got five more, more minutes, and I, I want to uh, move on now to, uh, to look at what I'm talking about as the accidental importance of therapy or questions of therapy and therapization within Weizenbaum's arguments. Um, 
And to do that, I want to uh, just go back and say that one reason that Weizenbaum was disconcerted with the over-enthusiastic reaction of therapists to ELISA was, as I've said, the choice of thinking about the therapeutic was largely made for convenience in the interests of a neat, uh, a neat uh, space to consider natural language processing. Weizenbaum chose to give ELISA that identity because the Rogerian therapy enabled extensive form of mirroring of the patient by the therapist. It draws the patient out by reflecting back. And that kind of dialogue is particularly amenable to simulation. Uh, the kinds of responses Eliza could produce might not seem tendentious or eccentric, but might seem more normal than expected. What I want to uh, suggest, really, is that, on the contrary, it's interesting to place the question of the therapeutic right at the heart of Weizenbaum's arguments about computer intelligence and about uh, the relationship between human and artificial intelligences. And I want to uh, make three claims or note three things. Firstly, uh, AI did announce itself as, uh, as a new way of understanding. It is a general system claims. It produces a kind of collision between systematic understandings of the social world. And Weizenbaum chose to use that example in his discussion of intelligence. To automate changing people's mind with a computer is what Eliza attempted to do. If you look at the content of Eliza, uh, the Eliza as medium, if you like, uh, distinguished from Eliza as uh, content, then we shouldn't be surprised, really, that this became uh, this arose as a question. I think it's an interesting to interesting to exploit it. Thirdly, uh, Weizenbaum felt that Eliza was picked up by therapists and lauded by therapists, because influenced by Skinner and behaviorism, they already had a mechanical model of mind and uh, were already, to some extent, working with a model of the human that was automated. But Rogerian therapy, as a matter of fact, was not really part of those behaviorist models of mind, or at least was certainly more or less openly in revolt against a kind of systems-level thinking that was explicitly cybernetic, for example, Lacanian cybernetics. Uh, and if you go back to where it came from, people like Carl Rogers in the 40s or Maslow, as they used it, were actually interested not in cybernetic systems operations or, or automation, if you like, but were above all interested in human empathy, the self, and discussed uh, therapization or successful therapy in terms of self actualization the curative force in psychotherapy, man's tendency to actualize himself, to become his potentialities, to act, express and activate all capacities of the organism. Why does this matter, uh, and why is it useful? This notion of therapy entails, uh, first, an understanding that therapy, the therapeutic engagement, if you like, is an operation on the self, undertaking in concert through a tight coupling between the therapist and the patient, and... Uh, the core of this therapeutic engagement is talk, narrative, uh, and produces, if you like, an account of the self, which then enables action. It's a serial, it's a serial process, if you like. Let me uh, now, and to some extent, I think the notion of what Nigerian therapy was, right at the heart of what uh, Weizenbaum produced within ELISA, I think there's a tension right there, actually, that, that it was always going to be an unworkable program for none of the reasons that Weizenbaum talked about, as a matter of fact. Let me now move on to compare or look at the tensions between another turn towards the consideration of therapeutic activity within computational contexts. I recently read Mark Andreevich's discussion of uh, what he talks about as the droning of experience uh, in, and I, although Andrzejewicz is really looking at the droning of experience in terms of big data networks and forms of social media and begins by looking at it very specifically in terms of law technologies and uh, droning technologies in terms of, uh, if you like, the, uh, in, ter in terms of the, the, simu the, the the, the joining together, if you like, of the notion of law and the enactment of justice. Or I think it's interesting to think about that in relation to the therapeutic. So 
Andrzejewicz looks at the automation of law as the rule of application, the rule and the application of the law merged together, the drone attack being the specific example of that. I think that's really interesting to think about too in relation to the notion of the simultaneous modulation of the self that's undertaken in relation to, for example, predictive or preemptive sentiment analysis, mind analysis, where, if you like, the therapeutic moment is condensed. So instead of the notion of the story, the notion of self-actualization of the self through the narrativization and the coming to an expanded realization of the self, what we have is a notion of the D, a notion of the self no longer as the expanded self-actualized subject, but the self as the becoming object, if you like, uh, around which networks operate. So I think the object in networks uh, as the therapeutic subject becomes not an expanded subject at all, but an attenuated de-actualized de subjectivity. And I think the question for us really is to ask how any therapeutic uh, environment can be sustained within that kind of state. So I'm really thinking about de-actualization as uh, the alternative to self-actualization as a way in which some of the questions that Weizenbaum raised around ELISA are coming up today in, rela in relation really to a world in which the question of subjects becoming intelligent agents and engaging with the computational in the way that Weizenbaum raised them have been replaced and we're looking really at the notion of how it is that subjects are modulated, moved and replaced and if you like simultaneously enacted and understood. And right, right at the very end, since I've run out of time, let me come back to this question of experience and, and for a moment to the question of knowledge, which I, I began with. To, yeah. yeah, okay, which I, I, I want to talk about just for, just, for two, <laughs> just for two seconds, really, because I want to point out, I want to point out in those networks, looking at those objects, thinking about humans as data objects being moved, I simply want to ask who in that set of circuits is gaining the knowledge, picking up the understanding, becoming expert, becoming a knowledgeable subject. And I would say, actually, the credit relationship there is entirely on the side of the machines. And that's really why I want to talk about de-expertization, if you like, as the consequence of a particular form of the droning of experience. And that de-actualization might be a way in which the notion of therapy as coming to know oneself is undermined in uh, our computational situation. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs>